Hi, everyone. I see some people joining in. Hello. Good morning. Good evening. <clears throat> we can wait for like five minutes for like sure. students in. PJ, would you prefer the like the chat feature or the Q and A, or either works for you? Um, I think chat feature might be fine, but yeah. Yeah. do you prefer the Q and A? Because no, I think that's okay. the chat's fine if students feel comfortable. Yeah, sharing publicly. <clears throat> we can always answer the questions at the end, right? <laughs> Just gonna wait a few more minutes to let students in. Do you maybe want to get started? Sure. It look like we have a lot of participants coming in, but uh, okay, we can get started. It's recorded okay. as well, so sure. Anyway, so yeah, uh, for those of you who are here, uh, welcome to this webinar that we're having to just prepare you to study in Canada and at Mount Allison as an international student. Um, so, firstly, just Thank you for joining. And uh, it's always nice to see international students applying to Mount A. I was an international student, so, um, and I've had a great journey here so far. So yeah, it's always, uh, it's always great to see some international students applying to Mount A. And we are excited for you to come here and help you with your journey uh, through the admissions process and also after you get admitted as well. So yeah, thank you for coming. So we're just gonna go over a couple of things today. Um, my name is Pushkaraj. Uh, I am the admissions officer working at the uh, admission, recruitment admissions and awards department at Mount Allison. And I am joined here with Krista. Krista, if you wanna sure. like, introduce yourself a bit. Yep. So my name is Krista Mastin. I'm the international student advisor at Mount A. And so <clears throat> you will be hearing lots from me over the summer uh, as we prepare for your arrival in the fall. So. I'm in charge of uh, programs and services for international students at Mount A, and this starts with international orientation. So it's a you'll learn more about it through the presentation, but um, it's a program that we offer to help students, uh, international students, get settled and learn all they need to know as they start their their time in Canada at Mount A. Um, so looking forward to connecting with all of you. Yeah, I can attest for sure that international center is a great resource to have for uh, international students. I. I've gone to Krista's office like a million times over my past four years, but uh, yeah, it's it's been great. So uh, let's get started with the webinar. Okay, so just a quick overview. This is your international team. So you see Krista's picture right there as well. And then we have um, Emily, who is the International Center Assistant. We have Margaret, who is the uh, International Recruitment Manager. Uh, we have Tayab, who is the international, you must have heard from Tayab as well a lot, like he is generally the one who does a lot of recruitment for international territories, and then we have Kutai, who is the director of admissions at, at Mount Allison, so this is a general interna like international admissions team, and we also have our own like other domestic recruitment team, I'm part of the, like I'm also part of the team, uh, and I'm did some of the applications uh, for some of you in in the call right now so i've been in contact with you as well so yeah it's good to it's good to see you join this join this webinar right now 
So yeah, moving forward. In today's session, we're gonna do a general review of the admission deadlines that are coming up. It is an important time of the year. There are um, general, general like admission deadlines that are coming up that you need to keep in mind. So uh, we will be talking about that and just next steps that come forward from here. And Krista will be taking you through the arrival and international orientation part, which is really exciting. Um, international orientation is one of the big experiences that you will have as a first year student. And as we all know, the main, the big elephant in the room is like the study permits, which is uh, a really big deal for international students. So Krista will go over that as well. And then we'll end with a general Q&A. Any questions you had regarding, regarding the webinar, regarding the presentation, or just in general, if you want any other uh, questions about student experience or international center, Krista and I can answer those. So firstly, I'll be going over through the admission deadlines and next steps. So uh, if you have not already, uh, the deadline to pay your registration deposit, which means that you're accepting your offer of admission um, for international students, that is 450 Canadian dollars, and the housing deposit if you're planning to live on campus in one of the residences that we have. Uh, and the deposit for that is $500. The deadline for both of these deposits is May 1st. And um, I know that we have been receiving a lot of this deposit. So if you have already sent it and we have not gotten a confirmation from us, that means it might just be in transit because international transactions do take some time. Uh, so once your deposit is received and processed, we will send you the deposit confirmation to your MTA email. And as soon as we receive it, we will also issue you the letter of acceptance, which you can use to apply for your study permit. So both of these things, um, if you don't plan on living on residence, you do not require to pay the $500 deposit, but um, you can certainly pay the registration deposit as well. And the housing deposits are refundable. And there are certain steps for that. So on, like by June 1st, they are fully refundable. By June 15th, they are partially refundable. And after that, it's non-refundable. So if you do plan, um, if you decide to live on rest on campus and then before June 1st, you are like, okay, I don't want to live on campus. You can send in a withdrawal application and then you can get your amount back. And then in those steps, you can, uh, um, after June 15th, I think it's non-refundable. So you will have to keep those time, those uh, deadlines in mind. So apply to live in residence. We have the link right here. You can also just, we will, I think we will be sending you this presentation and this will also be recorded. So you will have this recording later, uh, but you can just go to applying residence uh, on the Mount A website and you can submit an application uh, to live on campus. Uh, the early bird room draw, had the deadline for that has passed. That was March 1st, I think, um, but you can still apply to live in residence and you will be asked to submit your choices and based on the availability for on-campus housing, you, you will be uh, assigned a residence room if you pay the housing deposit before the May 1st deadline. After that, it is not guaranteed. Generally, the preference or the priority is given to students who submit their housing deposits on time. And you can also find off-campus off accommodation um, through the off-campus housing directory that our Mount Allison Student uh, Students Union has on their website. Uh, Mount A does not guarantee off-campus housing. That is not something that we, um, like as a university take care of, but there is general off-campus housing available. And this directory will basically give you the contacts of all the landlords that are there in the town. And then you can reach out to them and plan your off-campus housing. Just an advice, uh, if you're looking to have an, like if you're live, looking to live off campus, it is important for you to start looking early because off-campus housing is uh, very competitive in a sense. Uh, I've lived here for four years and uh, you always need to have a, ha, ha, need to start early to get into a proper off-campus housing accommodation. And yeah, apply for your study permit as soon as possible. That's one of the most important things. And Krista will um, talk more about that. But um, yeah, as soon as you get a letter of acceptance, that is basically our way from the university saying that you have been admitted, you have paid your registration deposit, and you can apply for your study permit now. And you can find more details on the uh, website www.mta.ca slash admitted. So if you have any questions about this later, you can just put it in the chat or we can have the Q&A section later as well. 
So for a lot of students, um, they generally, for students who are still in high school, they do not get their, generally they will not have their official final transcripts uh, generally by June. So right now, if you have an offer, offer of admission, we do need our official final transcripts that are sent directly by your school or your institution uh, to confirm that admission. So if some of the students who have already graduated uh, high school in let's say 2021, 2022, and then we have received your transcripts and we have verified them, uh, that technically means that you do not need to send those, but for students who are currently still in high school, uh, finishing their grade 12, and they are gonna be getting their final transcripts sometime in June, uh, you should be um, requesting your institution to send those official transcripts directly from your email so that we can verify it and confirm your offer of admission. Also for students who are um, in, who are doing international baccalaureate or have A-levels, um, Caribbean advanced proficiency exams, or any student who has some sort of, uh, has the ability to do a transfer credit assessment. Um, they may be awarded uh, based on your like university preparatory programs that you have. Um, so just make sure that you also um, reach out to the academic advisors or like as soon as you get your offer of admission, like you can start um, your transfer credit assessment process. So you can reach out to the academic advisors at advisor at mta.ca and um, have that conversation with them if you can get your uh, some of your credits transferred to the university, which is always great. Like if you get some of those credit transferred, you basically have um, some sort of a push with your degree program. Like you get those extra credits and then you probably won't have to do some courses at the university, which is always nice. I wish I got some uh, transfer credits when I came in. Uh, it's also important to have uh, all these up updates on our social media, which is a great way to keep uh, to be on track in a sense like I know emails can be pretty boring and sometimes you don't even open your email inbox so like social media is a great way to like just keep on track and what's happening because we also the same deadlines that we post on our email or like you get that information through email it also is uploaded on social media so and it just looks more pretty uh, on social media so keep uh, you can join our Facebook group incoming students Facebook group um, the link is in the presentation and you can also follow us on Instagram on mta.international. Um, they have some really amazing posts and um, you will see that once you come here, uh, MTA International does a lot of things for international students. So there's a lot of exciting events. Yeah. So it'll be great to just keep a track of that through social media. Uh, another important thing, like a lot, uh, I've been getting a lot of emails about this as well, is that what to do once we've paid the deposits, like what's the next step? So the next step would be your course registration. Uh, unfortunately, it only opens in June. So you have this month to focus on your study permit applications and Krista will go over that, but course registration will open in June. And the way it works is that uh, you will be given a unique uh, time slot to register for courses. So it's it's not like it opens on June 1st and everyone can register for it. You will be emailed and you'll be given a particular time slot where you're like, okay, you have this time period to register for your courses. What I do recommend is the course schedule for the next semester is already out. So what you can do is you can go to your self-service account and uh, under course catalog, you can look for the courses that you uh, would like to take. Um, and then you can kind of, uh, there's a calendar where you can like try and register for the courses and it gives you a layout of what your schedule is going to look like. This is very important because some of the times um, the courses you want to take might conflict because of the timings. So just to kind of plan ahead, it'll be nice to go to the course catalog and just uh, plan out the courses you want to take. And as soon as the registration opens, you can just, you have to register through the same portal. So you will register through self-service. Uh, you will basically just have everything already laid out for you and you just have to click register and it will kind of do that automatically so just it's a it's a good advantage to have to just plan your next semester ahead uh, of the schedule and uh, you can also look at the degree audit forms based on your uh, online based on your program to kind of get an idea of what courses you need in those initial years to kind of um, complete your program so and you can always reach out to academic advising to plan your uh, degree program as well. So that again would be advisor at mta.ca or you can book a meeting with your academic advisor 
uh, they're generally very booked up. So that again is uh, another thing that you need to plan ahead and get a meeting with them is uh, you can plan your degree program with them and what courses you need to take and everything. And obviously check your at mta.ca email regularly. Uh, I know that until now you have been getting a lot of your emails uh, to your personal account. Um, so it's important um, now that will be shifted to your at mta.ca accounts. Just make sure that you're checking that regularly because you will be getting a lot of updates there. And submitting your official documents, you need to email those to admissions team at mta.ca. So, um, and this is not you personally, like if you're submitting official documents, they have to come directly by the institution because otherwise it's considered unofficial. And we also ensure that like, if the email is coming from the institution, it has to come from their official email. It um, cannot be a particular individual from the institution sending the email. Like it has to seem that it's coming from the actual institution itself. And we do verify that. So just make sure that you're telling your university or your um, high school to send all of your official documents through their official email or you can mail them to the registrar's office. The address is right below there at the bottom of the presentation. So you can also mail them to us, but email is always faster because international mail can take some time. So yeah, the, I spoke a lot. I'm just gonna pass it on to Krista and she's gonna take, take it from here. Can you go back one slide, PJ? There were just a couple yeah. of things that I wanted to mention. Sure. So yeah. one on the academic advising, um, and, and course registration. I hear a lot from students um, that arrive in August potentially have not registered yet for courses because they feel like they're unsure about what they should register in. Maybe it's difficult to get an academic advising appointment over the summer. Um, <clears throat> again, plan ahead. So it is something like PJ said, you could be, sorry, push crash, uh, said you could be doing that planning now and reaching out for an academic advising appointment or reaching out to the academic advisors to kind of go over what you've what you've selected, but it's really important to register early. Um, it's not something that we recommend that you wait until you arrive um, to complete because courses will fill up, and so for you to have the best chance at getting the courses that you need and you want, you really should be registering early. The other important reason to register early, uh, if you're planning on staying in residence. Uh, they do look for, um, the university looks for course registration as a confirmation that you are indeed coming, um, coming in the fall. Uh, so this would always be communicated to you through email, but there may be a date set um, over the summer where you'll need to have your course registration completed. Uh, to, to secure and to, uh, to hold your room and residence. Um, so there's lots of reasons to the, to, that you benefit from registering early. Um, and so, yeah, just to kind of plant that seed. Um, also, if you can't get an academic advising appointment, uh, you can always email the advisors. And I put the email in the chat there. Um, you don't need to have an appointment. Like you could, you know, have a look at your schedule and have a look at the, the timetable and you know, have a suggested, like, this is what I'm thinking about, and then email the advisors. Uh, they're able to, you know, to respond to emails sometimes faster than they're able to, to fit you in for an appointment. So, um, so don't be, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out by email. The other point that I wanna mention from this slide is your Mount A email. Um, so it is really important to check your Mount A email uh, it is kind of the official means of communication. So yes, we use social media and yes, from, from the International Center, we do try to send out emails to both personal and Mount A, but there's a lot of important information that will be sent to your Mount A email that you really need to, you need to regularly be, be checking that even once a week, making sure you're going through. The one thing I'll caution is that we do receive regular spam emails to your Mount A account. Uh, and what I mean by that is it might be like fraudulent emails asking you to put in your e like your username and password or click this link um, and be really cautious of that. If you're ever unsure, I mean, number one, you should never give your password. Mount A will never ask you to put your password, uh, send your password through email. So that will never happen. Um, if you're ever unsure, you could send it to me, send it to the International Center and just say, is this, is this real? Should I be responding to this? 
um, because sometimes what happens is students will get locked out of their accounts because you know they gave their password and then something happened uh, and then you don't end up receiving those emails so don't hesitate it happens you know regularly you know don't feel ashamed if it happens reach out and we can help you get it sorted out but um yeah just to be cautious of those those spam emails yeah that's all i had to say about that and then we can talk about arrival and international orientation <clears throat> oh. okay so as PJ noted, international orientation is a really fun and significant part of your first year, I would say, um, at Mount A. So I really encourage students to register and to participate. Pushkaraj was our international orientation chair 2019, PJ? I think it was 2020. Yeah. 2020. Yeah. Um, so we always have a full time student that is wor that works over the summer um, to help plan, help the office kind of plan the orientation. They're kind of your main contact. You could ask all of your questions about what to bring and what to expect. And they they organize a group of facilitators, of volunteers that kind of help uh, help you prepare uh, for your for your time at Mount A. So it's a really positive experience. Uh, it's really important to to come. So we'll start communicating with you um, in a little bit later in May uh, about international orientation. So registration hasn't yet opened, uh, but it will open later in May. Again, check your Mount A emails and, uh, and I'll send the information through email to students. Um, so international orientation happens from Monday, August 28th to, Mon uh, to Thursday, the 31st of August. But over the summer, we will do some programming as well. So um, again, uh, as PJ mentioned, there's social media, again, through email. Um, we also will set up a Moodle page. So Moodle is a platform. Some of you may be familiar with it from your high school, uh, but it's just an online platform where we can share videos and, uh, and, and other content. And so we'll have a Moodle page that students will be able to access some of that um, some of that programming. So we'll do interviews with current students, uh, again, to kind of, you know, learn about, you know, working while in Canada and how to get involved and was it, what is it like to live in residence. So all of these burning questions that you likely have as you prepare for your time at, at Mount A and in Canada, we'll start answering those questions even over the summer. So again, look for those details starting um, a little bit later in May. So last week of May, you should expect to start, uh, start seeing that information. Um, a question that I get a lot around this time and over the summer is around our airport pickup service. And so Monday, August 28th is kind of that dedicated arrival day. So we don't have a lot of programming happening on that day. That's the day that's kind of set aside for students to arrive to campus, to move into residence. That is the first day that you're able to move into residence if you're a resident student. So you can't arrive earlier than that. If you arrive on the 27th, which sometimes students would do, they'd arrive one day early just because of the flights. You'd have to stay in a hotel uh, close to the airport, but we would pick you up the next day and uh, and bring you to campus. So the 28th is that dedicated arrival day. So please try your best to book your flight so that you're arriving in on that day. Uh, and we will pick you up from the airport or from a hotel, uh, if that's where you're staying, uh, and bring you to campus. And then, of course, our programming will run from the 29th to the 31st. Um, and again, this is everything from, you know, information sessions to panel discussions. Again, we have a group of volunteers, so about 20 upper year students from all over the world uh, who have, you know, have been in your shoes, uh, have been first year international students arriving to Canada and getting settled, and they'll give you all the advice and the tips and tricks uh, to be successful. Um, so lots of sessions. There's also a trip. We the picture at, uh, on the top there is of a, our, a our one of our traditions of international orientation is to take a trip to the beach, uh, play some volleyball, go for a swim. Um, so so yeah, it's really it's really a great experience, uh, and students who participate in it um, often have really great things to to say about it. Uh, you'll see Aiko there on the bottom corner. So Aiko is our uh, international orientation chair, so IO chair, as we we shorten international orientation to IO. Um, 
yeah, she is our chair for this summer. So you'll be hearing lots from Aiko as well. And she'll be doing, again, all of that kind of pre-arrival programming. Um, yeah, getting students ready to, to arrive. Aiko is a third year student and she's from Mexico. So I think we can go to the next slide, PJ. Okay, so as PJ said, a very important um, piece, a part to preparing for your arrival is your study permit application, your Canadian study permit application. Some of you may have already applied for your study permit, and that's great. If not, I'm just going to briefly go through the process. Um, and then if you have any specific questions, you can you can let us know. Um, so you should be applying online for your uh, for your study permit. There was once a time when paper applications were accepted. They during COVID they stopped accepting paper applications, except if like if you're visually impaired or if you have some extenuating circumstance. There's some uh, cases where you can apply by paper. But really, you should be expect you should be planning to uh, submit your information uh, and your application through the IRCC secure account. And IRCC stands for Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. So that's Canada's kind of immigration department. So that's where you'll be submitting your study permit application. So we do have a step by step guide on our website, and I really recommend that students use this to guide you through uh, because again there are some there are some things to consider there's some um, there's some information that uh, is not clear online if you just use this you know the IRCC site to kind of guide you through there's some additional information that students really should consider that we at Mount A know from years of helping students with study permit applications. Um, and so we pass that along to you, but you need to read the guide. So you really need to go through the guide um, step by step when you're submitting your study permit um, so that you can get that information so that you prepare the strongest application that you that you can uh, to get that study permit. There's a couple of videos as well. And again, as PJ noted, we'll be sharing this uh, presentation and recording, and so you'll be able to access those links. But there's uh, there are two videos that have been created, one for the regular study permit stream, uh, and the second one is for the SDS, so the student direct stream, um, which is the, some of you may know of, is kind of like the fast track uh, study permit application process. It's only available in certain countries, uh, but they do guarantee a faster processing of a study permit application. But there's some specific requirements for that um, that you would need to that you would need to meet. But you don't. That's not a requirement. You can apply through the regular stream. But there are two videos there to help students um, guide you through. Again, all the information that's in the videos is in the the guide as well. That PDF guide uh, that you can find on our website. Um, as far as processing times, it's it's tricky to estimate. I mean, IRCC says approximately 13 weeks. I even think right now online, if you look, it's shorter than that. They say seven weeks, I think, for outside of Canada. But really, it depends on where you're applying from. So if you're applying from the States, the processing time, if you're applying from the United States, the processing time might be two weeks for a study permit. But if you're applying in you know, Nigeria, for example, it could be months. And so really that's why we say it's best to apply as early as possible um, because it can, yeah, it can vary between you know, one month to, to three months to kind of get a Canadian study permit. And unfortunately, Mount A has no kind of impact on that. So sometimes students will email and say, you know, I've been waiting and you know, I still haven't heard anything. Is there anything that Mount A can do to speed this up? I wish we could, but we really don't have any impact. The Canadian Immigration Department is completely separate from the colleges and universities in Canada, and there's not much we can do to, you know, to help speed up a process or, yeah, or have any impact on applications. Go to the next slide. If you have any questions as we go through, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. <clears throat> 
Okay, so when, again, if you go through the guide, it will take you through the links, um, you know, where to access the portal, how to set up your account. I just wanted to flag a few important notes about the study permit application uh, here in this presentation. And then if you have any questions as follow up, then we can address those. One question uh, we get a lot um, over the summer when students are doing their study permit applications is about this question in the, in the portal. So is work an essential component of your studies. A lot of times students want to work while they're in Canada, so you might be inclined to say, yes, this is essential to my studies. But at Mount A, work, we don't have co-op work programs at Mount A, which is what this question is really asking, uh, is, is, your, is your program a co-op program? So for your Mount A studies, you should be saying no to this question. But this does not mean that you won't be permitted to work uh, in Canada. It's just that it's not a co-op work program. It's not a co-op work permit that you'd be applying for. Students, full-time students coming into a degree program at Mount A are eligible to work while in Canada. Part-time off campus uh, during the academic term, so you can work up to 20 hours a week off campus, um, unlimited number really of hours on campus, but we, you know, we generally recommend to have about 20 hours of work, um, both on campus, off campus, when you're studying full time. But then during breaks, like the summer uh, and during our winter break and our spring break, those one week periods, students can work full time. And that's all through your study permit. So um, again, you should be answering no to this question uh, in, the, in the application. Go to the next page, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so after you go through the questionnaire, so you'll have a few, quite a few pages of answering questions like the previous page, um, and then you'll get to the upload page. So this is the part of the portal where you're going to upload the documents that IRCC is asking for. Um, so they, um, yeah, so the first, uh, the first note there, the application for a study permit made outside of Canada, that's a PDF form and you just put in your information. I think it's four pages, you know, everything from your name and date of birth and, you know, travel history and, you know, uh, and so on. So you just answer those questions uh, and then you will upload that application form. The next is a letter of acceptance. So again, um, at Mount A, you receive your letter of acceptance after you've paid your deposit. So again, if you haven't yet, it's important to pay your deposit, then you will receive that letter of acceptance that you need for your study permit application. Your passport, so again, you'll need to scan your passport and upload it. Uh, proof of financial support. So for this, the, the kind of minimum requirement uh, for your study permit application is to show proof that you have enough to cover tuition for your first year, as well as living expenses for your first year. And living expenses uh, right now are estimated at $10,000 per year. So for Mount A, you're looking at around $29,000 uh, in, in your proof of financial support. Um, and again, I won't get into it. If you click on the, uh, the question mark within here, it will give you examples of what you might be able to use. Um, I'll also mention later, um, there are guides specific for your country of residence, so where you are living, and those are really important to refer to for the financial proof um, documents because each country, so what a visa officer wants to see in India is very different from what they might want to see from China. And so the when you look at the visa office instructions for your country, uh, it will tell you exactly what they look for with the proof of financial support. Um, but that that's the kind of the guideline. Uh, you also need a digital photo. And then there's the last one, there's a family information form. Um, I don't think all students actually are queued for this, but many of you will receive this as well. And it's just putting in information of your immediate family members. Um, sorry, one thing that I'll go back to the first application form, that top one. Um, when you click on this from within the online system, it's going to give you a please wait error message. If you've gone through this, you know what I'm talking about. You, you can't just click on that application form and, and fill it out. You need to download it. So you need to save it onto your computer, 
and then open it in a PDF reader like Adobe Reader. Um, it will always give you that please wait message if you just click on it and try to open it in your browser. Again, this is this is highlighted and there's some tips given to, to get around that in the study permit application guide. Okay, so as I mentioned, <clears throat> there are, these are really crucial. Uh, this, this piece is very important and it's something that's not clearly outlined on the IRCC site. Um, and so if you're just applying on your own and not looking at you know, other, um, other guides, it's something that can be missed, but it's really important. So again, each country has instructions. It's a PDF document uh, specifically for study permits. And so they actually, some countries um, require uh, or strongly recommend really specific documentation. Um, and you won't see those documents listed um, in, the, in the upload page. Uh, and so it can be confusing because you say, okay, they're asking for language test results, for example. So in India, for example, they do uh, ask for um, language test results. It's not a, a standard requirement for a study permit, so you won't see it listed as a, as a required document. But really, I think you would have a hard time getting a study permit in India if you don't supply a language test result. So that is noted in the visa office instructions. And again, that's just one example, but you really should be looking at the instructions for your country and make sure that you have everything included that they're asking for. There isn't an upload for all of those additional documents. So what you will do is put them in the client information upload. So at the bottom of that upload page, there is a field client information. And this is where you'll upload, just you put all of those additional documents together. So language test results, some countries will ask for a police certificate, um, a study plan, which we'll get into a bit more detail next. Um, yeah, so all of those additional documents you would put in the client information um, upload and that will all just kind of be uploaded into the same application for a review. So any additional documents that you want to submit that aren't captured in the specific uploads, you can put all of that in the client info. Anything I missed there, PJ, that you can think of on the study permit mm -hmm. side? No, I think that was pretty much like I can speak for India and like you were right, like I had to upload like my IELTS result and uh, a couple of other things. So like, but I think you pretty much covered everything on yeah. that. Okay. Okay, so a study plan, sometimes called a letter of explanation. So for some of you, this is again, not news. Um, if you were, if you're coming to, to Canada, to Maune through an agent, often agents will, uh, will flag this as well as a, as a required document for a study permit. But again, it's not something that is asked for in the system. So you do need to upload it um, into the client information. And so even if you're not asked for a study plan, it's always recommended to, to give one because sometimes study permits are rejected because they don't have all the information or all the answers to questions that they that an officer might have. So giving a study plan, a letter of explanation really allows you to kind of tell your personal story to the visa officer. Um, yeah, so that they don't have any questions that you know that they can base a, a refusal on. So just to note some of the things that uh, you should touch on in a in a letter of explanation or a study plan. So why you want to study in Canada and why Mount Allison, how your studies in Canada and at Mount A will fit with your future career and study plans. Um, how you'll pay for your studies and your living expenses. So again, you'll use the financial proof um, upload for those, the, you know, the bank documents and maybe the letter from the persons um, supporting you. But you can also touch in your study plan um, about, you know, again, it's a four-year program. So maybe you're touching on how like long-term um, over the course of your education, how, what is your plan for supporting your studies, the ties that you have to your home country, so this is important because sometimes we see study permits rejected because an officer 
isn't satisfied that a student will return to their home country when they're finished their studies. Now, some of you may be saying like, well, I do want to stay in Canada after I graduate. Pushkaraj is one example. I mean, he came, he stayed here for four years. He now has a work permit that he will, you know, he does plan to, to stay in Canada. But it's important not to mention this in your study permit application. Um, and the reason is because this application is only for your studies. And an officer needs to be satisfied that if at the end of your studies, if you're not eligible to stay, if you're not eligible for a work permit, that you will return home. And so the, the ties to your home country is important because they want to know that you'll be able to, you know, and then you have some reason to return home at the end of your studies if, if that's required. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so that next point is that you will return home to your country um, following the period of your authorized stay. Again, there are pathways to stay in Canada, and I know a lot of international students make the choice to study in Canada because of that, and it's completely okay. But for your study permit application, for your study plan, you shouldn't be talking about your dreams to stay in Canada after you graduate because it can just be an issue with an officer approving your application. Um, so you don't want to be dishonest, but you also want to uh, convince uh, an officer that if you need to return home that you that you will and that you have the, the connections and the support um, to return home at the end of your stay if required. The other thing I'll note, note uh, here is if you're a student who is a citizen of one country, but you're residing, like you have temporary resident status or you're residing, maybe your parents are working in another country, it's important to note this um, in your study plan because sometimes students will receive rejections in these cases because if, they, if you don't show your connections to your home country, there sometimes can be concern that if you have temporary status in the country you're currently living in, at the end of your studies, what will happen if that temporary status is then expired? So um, in some of those cases, you need to just, again, show your connections to your home country where you have citizenship so that you can satisfy an officer that you, that you do have a place to return to at the end of your studies if required to. Okay. I think that's it for that. And I don't, oh yes. Oh, I think if you click again, PJ, if there's more, oh, like I see it goes step by step. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so just to kind of give you an overview of what to expect um, from the time you submit your application to um, your departure from home and off to Canada. So the step one is again, submitting that application online. Step two is getting your biometrics completed. So that's your fingerprints and your photos. So you will be, unless you're from the United States, which it's not required for students in the States, uh, but for anyone else, you will need to get your biometrics completed after you submit your application. So you'll submit your application and then you'll automate, the system will, will, um, will cue a biometrics instruction letter. Uh, and that's the letter that you that tells you how to sign up for your biometrics and set up your appointment. And then you take that letter with you to have your photos and your fingerprints taken at a visa application center or visa office. Um, step three, medical exam and police certificate. So it's an option to wait until after your application is submitted to get your medical exam. But I would suggest that if you know that you are from a country that requires a medical exam, you can do that in advance of your application submission and then upload it into your application. That would be my recommendation instead of waiting for them to ask you for it and then having to go and get it. Either option is available, um, but again, in, sometimes it's recommended just for speed of processing that you do what you need to have done before you submit your application so there's no extra step there. But th it is an option to do it um, when you're asked for them. Step four is waiting. So <laughs> again, two to three months, like it can really depend. It won't take two months in some countries. Uh, it can take more than three months in others. Um, and again, like I'll just note, sometimes 
applications are rejected um, and, and students have submitted a second application. So in a rejection, it will tell you what you didn't include or what you didn't address or why you know, the officer wasn't uh, satisfied, but there's always an opportunity to reapply. So you can always reapply and try to address the issues um, that are um, that are noted. And so applying early gives you time to do that. So if you wait until August to apply for your application and then you get a rejection at the end of August, you don't have time to, you know, to submit a new application. But if you submit now and in a couple of months you get a rejection, then, you know, maybe you have time then to to resubmit a second application to address any issues. Again, hopefully that's not happening, but we do see that happen where students will get a refusal letter and then have to you know, improve their application or give additional documents to, to reapply. Okay, and then step five is, is approval. So um, what this looks like is, is you would get a, a, a letter or a mail in your IRCC account which says you have been approved uh, for your study permit. Um, and this is, the, this is the document you will receive, uh, sorry, this is the document that you will bring with you to Canada. And uh, when you're at immigration at the first airport, your first port of entry, they'll give you your actual study permit. But the letter of introduction is the approval letter um, that you'll then bring to the immigration officer in Canada who will give you your study permit. And then the last step, oh yes. <clears throat> so if you are in a country that requires a temporary resident visa, so that's the sticker that goes in your passport, that's separate from the study permit. Um, before you actually receive your approval letter, you will receive a passport request letter. Um, so that's always a really good sign. So if you see a passport request letter, it means that your study permit has been approved and now they want your passport to put the sticker in uh, to put your visa in before your before they give you the official approval of your study permit so just to note that uh, you will be requested for your passport if you are uh, required to have a trv i know in some countries like i think in nigeria they ask for your passport actually while it's being processed so that they can do it automatically but otherwise generally you're asked to send in your passport um, if you are not from a, a, a visa required country, uh, you do need an ETA, but they do that automatically. There's no separate application for that. It's processed with your study permit application. So there's nothing additional that you need to do. And I think that's it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Um, I just, I'll just go back to one slide and I just wanted to add something on like for step three, uh, as uh, Krista said that you can either give like the medical exam before or after, um, like in my case, I, I gave it before I applied for my study permit and it did help with like speeding up the process. But again, like it's different for each country and uh, it is going to be a different process. Sometimes if you think um, this is like personally speaking from my experience and what we do in the admissions office as well, um, if you're visa processing is taking time and it's going beyond your fall intake, you can always um, just reach out to us and get your uh, intake deferred. So you can like get your intake deferred to winter semester so we can give you the right documents to apply for your study permit for that semester in a sense, because <clears throat> I think you won't be able to, you will need another off letter, which indicates that you're coming in the winter semester rather than the fall semester. So just keep that in mind. Um, so you do that process as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Cause that's what happened to me. Like I applied for the fall semester, but I couldn't apply for visa in time. So I just got my semester deferred and then I got the letter for the winter intake and then I applied for that and uh, I got a visa for that. So I came in the winter semester. Yeah, just wanted to point that out, but uh, that's pretty much it with the presentation. Um, feel free to ask any questions that you like about the presentation itself or just about Mount A in general. And Krista and I will try our best to answer your questions. I think you can put it in the chat box or maybe we can have the Q and A section open as well. No questions there. Maybe while we're waiting to see if there are any questions, I'll just note, um, for the international orientation registration, 
again, this will be sent to students through email, but there are there will be two uh, forms that you'll fill out. The first one is just to register for international orientation to tell us that you're planning on arriving. Um, and you can do this as soon as the application, uh, as soon as the registration opens. The second um, registration that will open a little bit later in summer in the summer is the travel registration and the airport pickup request. Um, because again, oftentimes students will not book their flights until their study permit is approved. And again, that might you know be July or August. So we have an international orientation registration so that you can tell us that you're planning on arriving and you can be on our, our mailing list. But then the travel registration is kind of a separate form where you can request that airport pickup and we'll ask for your, your travel details. I think we do have uh, two questions here and I can just read them out and Krista, if you want, you can answer them and I can also. So one of them is, uh, will someone guide us with winter clothing and necessities? Yes, for sure. So. Um, Again, I mean, like in some cases, you might be able to bring some, you know, clothing or appropriate wear from home, but um, oftentimes it's not, that's not really accessible. And so as part of international orientation, we actually do uh, plan a trip to the uh, a shopping mall, a large shopping center that's located in, in Moncton, um, which is about a 30 minute drive from here. It's sort of the larger city center that's close to Sackville. Uh, so we take all the students to the shopping mall and that, you know, so there's lots of other things that you might not, you know, be able to travel with or carry with. Um, bedding is one of them. You might want to get some. Um, anyway, so there's other things that you might need when you arrive. And also winter clothing is one of those. When you arrive in August, it's it's still nice. It's it's summer weather. Um, you might find the evenings a bit a bit chilly, but you don't need any winter gear yet. But taking you to the mall at that time. Um, the hope is that you can get all of those things that you need before the weather, the weather starts turning, um, you know, later into September, October, November. Uh, so you can get those winter boots and so on. And, and yeah, we'll have a session. One of the kind of round table discussions we have is around like winter and what to expect and uh, how students, how some students kind of navigated that, uh, you know, what, what clothing and accessories were really important to have that maybe they didn't realize and then you know so that you can kind of learn from you know learn from some of their uh their learnings and, and mistakes um so yes for sure we will we will touch on that and we will provide you with uh transportation to the shopping center to get those things that you need yeah the question is has a date for preview day been decided um I think we were still in the talks of doing that, but definitely uh, that is that is happening right now and you will be notified through emails soon. And again, social media, like everything that happens in the emails is also posted on social media. So as soon as that the date for that has been decided, like you will be notified. I hope that answers your question. I know like there's a lot of things. Usually like, it's in like mid to late July though, typically, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. that's correct. I think I heard someone in the office yesterday like, talking about that. So yeah, it is It is definitely- It probably happening. hasn't been set yet, but yeah, um, I'm sure communication will go out to all new students once it has been set. Yep. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the question is, could you link the Massive Off-Campus Housing website? I just put that in the chat right now, so you can use that and uh, there's a whole directory and information on how to apply for it and uh, just other stuff uh, like tenants insurance and um, other information like that as well, which is important. So yeah, you can just look up the website. Uh, will someone be there to help us open a bank account in Canada and guide us with money withdrawals? So Chris, I think you can take yeah. that. Yes, yeah. so during international orientation, um, we do have, there's two local banks in town. So uh, the Bank of Nova Scotia or Scotia Bank as well as RBC, so Royal Bank. Um, and so their representatives of both of those banks come to campus for international orientation and help students set up an account. So it's free to set up an account. They'll help you through that. Um, if you have any questions specifically around like money transfers between uh, you know, like international money transfers, they, they'll be able to answer those, those questions. Um, so both bank account, both banks offer you know free student accounts. Um, so there's no monthly charge to have that account. Um, and then for money withdrawal, again, you would just use that you know that Canadian bank account, um, yeah, to kind of withdraw your money um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure what you mean by the money withdrawal piece. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or if, if my answer, uh, if yeah, answered your question, but, but the banks will be on, on campus and they will be able to answer any of those specific questions you have and you can have your bank account set up at yeah. that time. And just another way, so as Krishna said, there's two bank accounts in, uh, in Sackville, and that's uh, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada and Scotiabank. So if you are planning to get bank accounts, it's advisable to get with these two banks because um, some mm -hmm. students come in with uh, other banks that are like TD and um, so the main office would not be in Sackville. So sometimes you will have to go to a different yeah. city or Moncton to actually go into the branch. Uh, yeah, so that was another question. Is there a CIBC bank in Sackville? Unfortunately, there is not. They, we only have Scotia Bank and uh, RBC. There is a CIBC ATM, I think. There is an ATM, but uh, if you would like to go to a branch, you will have to go to Moncton for that or probably Amherst, but <laughs> Moncton would probably be a safe Yeah, event. and it might be, I'm not sure for the specific question, but sometimes students come in with like a GIC, which is a guaranteed investment. Yeah. It, I think. Um, and so maybe that's where you have it set up through CIBC. Um, so again, you will need to get to Moncton and, and sometimes students even, um, yeah, during that the trip that we take to Moncton to go shopping, like you could take a quick taxi ride to the CIBC uh, branch and, um, and access mm -hmm. that GIC or do what you need to to kind of uh, to access that. It doesn't stop you from getting an, a bank account through RBC or Scotiabank. Um, so just to say that, uh, you know, students who have a GIC through CIBC still, you know, some often decide to get an RBC or a Scotiabank so that they can use that as they continue through their studies. Um, yeah. And then another question was, when does one academic year uh, usually end? So an academic year ends in April, so it's just ending right now. Um, so the full year would be is divided up in two semesters. There's the fall semester, which starts in September and ends in December. And you, then you get a, a short winter break of almost two and a half, three weeks. And then your winter semester starts again in January and then ends in April. So that's basically one academic year, and then you get the summer off from May to uh, end of August. I hope that answers your question. And we're almost coming to an end right now, but uh, I know that there is another meeting scheduled <laughs> at 11 o'clock. So yeah, if you have any, we have two minutes, if we can take like one or two more questions if you have any questions, but you can always reach us. Uh, you can reach Krista at uh, cmaston at mta.ca. If Krista, you want to put your email in there. And if you have any general inquiries, you can just email admissions at mta.ca and we can help you out with that as well. Um, but I hope uh, this information was helpful to you all. And then if you have, again, any follow up questions, feel free to reach out. Okay, so another one. Do international students need to go back in the winter break in December? Um, Chris, do you want to answer that? Or I can... sure, yeah, so if you're living in residence, um, you can stay in residence over the winter <clears throat> break. There's an additional fee because you typically the residence is actually closed down in the winter in that winter break because most students will like will will move out or go home if they're domestic students. Um, but for international students that are not, you know, don't plan on traveling home for those few weeks, you can apply to stay in residence. There is a charge um, to stay for those three weeks, but that's quite a common um, option for students that don't want to travel. Uh, you'll just stay, yep, yeah, stay in residence. So you're not, you know, you're, yeah, you're not forced to, to leave. If you do want to stay or need to stay, then you can stay in residence during that break. And just from my experience, I, I have been here all winter breaks, all four years. So I've been here, so, and even summer breaks. So you can you can stay here. Some students do tend to go back, but it's also expensive to go back. So it is a fair decision to uh, try and stay here. And you can always, uh, there's another thing is you can sublet if you're living on campus. Um, there are students who leave for the summer or for winter. So you are allowed to like sublet their housing. So you can just live in their apartment while they're gone. So that is also a thing. Uh, I think this is the last question that I'm going to answer because there's one more uh, meeting that we have right now. But uh, can students visit their home country during academic breaks? So and yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, yes. it's, yeah, there's no, there's no, yeah, like limitations on that. I'm from immigration or from, um, from Mount A. So 
Um, the one thing I will say, I mean, depending on where you're coming, uh, where your home is, uh, like we do have a one week break in both the fall and the winter terms. Um, but so again, that, that's one week. So depending on how far you know away home is, it might not make sense to, to travel. But if you want to, you, you, know, you certainly could. Um, and then you know, the, the longer breaks are obviously the summer break and then the break between terms in December, which is typically about a two and a half or three week break, which is when students, if they do want to travel home, that's typically when they would. And a lot of students do as well. So it is it is pretty common. Anyway, I hope uh, all the questions have been answered. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I hope uh, you got the information that was required. I know it's a, it's a stressful time. And um, there's a lot of things going on as, as students were applying to a Canadian university for the first time and trying to come to Canada for the first time. It is it is a stressful situation, but it's also pretty exciting. You're not going to get to experience this again. I was stressed out, but I'm glad that I did it. So and we're always there to help you out. So if there's any other questions, if you need any assistance, feel free to reach out to Krista or admissions and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, I'm just going to quickly answer this one. Uh, you. <laughs> You cannot register for COSID right now because it's not open for incoming students. It will be open in June. So as soon as that opens up, you will be notified. Although, as I mentioned, you can kind of plan out what courses you want to take. So you can go to self-service and the schedule is already out. So you can see what courses are available, uh, what time of the week, who's the prof, uh, professor, and all of those things. But um, you can't technically register for it right now, but it will open in June. So as soon as that happens, you will be notified. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I know there are questions, but I, we do need to get to the different, uh, the other. Um, Send an email we too. Have. We're happy to answer questions through email. So if you have, yeah. if you still have questions or want to answer and uh, ask a question in, in private, then you can send us an email. And uh, have a wonderful day, uh, whatever the time is. I know there's different time zones right now, but yeah, have a wonderful day and uh, thank you for joining. Thanks, everyone.